Good everyone, I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. It's 5 o'clock and it's Wednesday, and so you know exactly what time it is. It is time for Live at 5. Once again, I'm excited to have this opportunity to be here with you to really discuss and to go over these great questions that have been sent in to me from you. And so I'm glad and honored to have this opportunity to, to be a part of answering some of those questions for you and uh, being able to learn uh, right along with you as well. You know, as God is downloading and giving me information, I'm researching finding out uh, the best biblical answer that I can possibly give you. Not only will it enrich the hearer, but it also enriches me as well. So I thank you for the questions. Keep them coming. Keep on throwing them at me. And I'm going to continue to be uh, as much of a blessing as I can with the answers that come directly from the Bible and with the knowledge that God has given me. Let's take a look at our question um, number one. These are all great questions. Uh, you might see a, a, a thread here, a theme here. But if not, don't worry about it. I'm going to be here to kind of help to kind of guide here. So let's take a look at question number one. It says, are there scriptures that I can sing or pray from the Bible that my wife and I can use to keep our newborn child safe and secure in this dangerous world? That's a really a great question. Uh, well, listen, the first thing we have to understand is that, um, you know, we've got as believers and as Christians, we've got to deal with this from an uh, aspect of faith and not from an aspect of magic. You know, when we look at prayer, prayer is not uh, some guarantee of anything. Which, which, what prayer is, it's a request for God's sovereignty in our life. That's exactly what it is. I mean, we're, we're asking God to do something, but it is not a way that we can move or manipulate God into protecting us. Um, and, and here's the interesting thing is, we don't have to do that. You know, we don't have to look at it from the perspective of, what do I need to do to get God to protect me? Because the truth of the matter is, you know, if you look at the Psalms, if you look at what he's written, we are in the palm of his hand. Every believer is already in the palm of the Lord's hand. And so we don't have to worry about, is there something I can say or something I can do to get God to do what he's already promised that he's going to do? You know, when we look at prayer, you know, we do, we, you know, we pray for safety of our children, traveling mercy. We, we pray for, you know, safety and, and, and God's governance over our relationship. And sometimes we can forget that God has already promised to protect us, to, to be with us, to never leave us or forsake us. That's not something that we need to move God to do. What we learn from, uh, even in our prayer, what we learn when we pray the word of God, what we learn when we study the word of God is that protection of who God loves is his nature. Protection of those that are his is part of what God is actually all about. It's who he is. It's not something he learns. It's who he is. And so, you know, it's also difficult for us to understand, you know, what protection really means from, you know, because of our view of what we're supposed to get out of the Christian life. Sometimes we're our thinking is that there's not going to be any trouble that comes with us. And if, you know, if we're believers, if we're Christians, health and comfort and safety is kind of part and parcel of the package of being, uh, you know, under the shadow of the Almighty. And sometimes, you know, when we look at our prayer, we have to really check our prayer. Because, you know, oftentimes what we think is the highest priority that God really has for us is our happiness and not necessarily his glory. And that's that's something that's really important that we really understand, that it, our happiness is not paramount. His glory is actually paramount. You know, God tells us that we are to expect trouble in this world. But God has already overcome the world. I want to read this to you so you can see this is not just my opinion. This is what the Spirit of the Lord has said in his word already. Let me read this. It says, this is in John chapter 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now, here's what it says. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, you know, when you look at this, this is a tough thing to hear. When we look at this, that, well, man, it's going to be trouble in the world. And that, you know, here's the thing that we're also hearing. God's not going to intervene in every area of trouble that we have. It doesn't mean he's not protecting us, but he doesn't intervene. Notice Jesus. The, God didn't intervene to stop them from crucifying Jesus on the cross. He didn't intervene to keep them from beating him all night and gnashing them with, uh, gnashing him with, the, with his teeth, with, with their teeth. You know, if we count the number of people that were in trouble, that were God's people, that he did not intervene, that would be in the thousands. You know, over, worldwide, it would be in the millions that, that, you know, God could have stopped some things and he simply did not stop. What we also don't recognize, you know, when we look at what God didn't do, we also miss what God did do. The number of times in the millions all over the world that he did intervene. So, you know, why does God intervene and protect in the way we see protection in one area and where, why he allows something to happen where we look at it, that person is totally unprotected in another area. Why is that? Well, here's the answer. We don't really know. 
What we do know and what the Lord has actually given us is that terrible things are going to happen to everybody. Everybody's going to suffer grief. Everybody's going to suffer loss. Everybody's going to suffer pain. No matter how beautiful you are, no matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, no matter how poor you are, no matter how rich you are, none of those things matter. In this world, the scripture says it's going to be trouble. We're going to all face these kind of losses. The thing is, we don't know when we're protected. That's, you know, that's, the Bible says we don't know how to pray as we ought. One of the things we have to grasp is when we feel unprotected, the truth of the matter is that we don't really know oftentimes when God is protecting us. We don't know what we're really protected from. We only know what we experience. You know, so I experience this hurt, but I don't realize sometimes that, man, what, what the enemy planned, God thwarted. You just got pricked on the arm. You just got a little tap here. And so when we look and say, I was not protected, we don't oftentimes realize what God is really doing and how he's really protecting us. And listen, why he doesn't protect us is equally as important as why he does. Listen, in the end of the day, all things work together for good. God works those together for his glory. And when you look at this, look at the story of Lazarus. You know, when you look at Lazarus, Jesus was not there. He could have been there. The, the Mary and Martha actually say the very same thing. Lord, if you were here, Lazarus would not have died. But here's the truth. God allowed Lazarus to suffer and be sick. He allowed Lazarus to get sick unto death. And then he allowed Lazarus to actually die for one reason. That in, when Jesus came and Lazarus was raised from that tomb, that Jesus would be glorified. That was the purpose. That pain, that death, those tears, that grief, that loss. All of those things were about one thing. Not personal protection for Lazarus. Not making sure his flesh never suffered. Not making sure no nothing came near his dwelling. no. It was to make sure and to guarantee that God would be glorified. That's what our lives are all about. So hopefully that will help you in really understanding in your prayer is that we want to make sure that we understand, yes, pray for protection, but there's no special prayer that is going to be a prayer that's above any other prayer that moves heaven to say, wow, you said the right thing. I'm going to send angels and give them charge over you. Those are already been given, but there's certain things that happen to us that we don't understand, but we do know that they are, are all and not in some chaos, but they're part of a tapestry, a plan of God that is going to work together for our good and for his glory. And that's paramount to the, re that's the reason why we go through what we go through. That's the reason why we're here, to give God glory. Hopefully, that help, ha that hopefully that's a blessing to you, and hopefully that helps, especially in whatever situations you may be going through. Let's take a look at our question, our number two. It says in the Bible verse, it says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But it seems like a contradiction since it also says that evil is ever present. Yeah, I can get that because it, it, it could sound like a contradiction. I mean, how do you resist someone who's always around you, right? Who's ever present. Well, the evil and the devil are not the same. You know, we connect evil and the devil and make them the same, but they're not the same. Satan is a being. Evil is an, a, a, an action, and evil is real as well. It is a response to something. So, you know, evil is an opposite or, or a lacking of something. It's a lacking of righteousness. It's a lacking of good. That's exactly what darkness is. Darkness is a lacking of light. That's what makes it what it is. And so when we look at Satan, Satan is a finite being. He is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere. But evil is ever present. It's always there. So when we look at this defeated foe, this, this you know, Satan, Lucifer, and, and we recognize who he is and that he is able to be able to resist it, he's able to be, he's, we have the ability to resist him simply because God has given us that power and people of faith have that power to resist this finite being, right? That's resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That's a complete, that's completely different from evil because this evil that's ever present doesn't reside in the devil. This evil that's always around does not reside in his minions and the demons that are all, that are out there. Though we wrestle against them, that's not the evil that Jesus is talking about. He says that evil resides in us. You know, James 1, 14 through 15 says this, and this is really important that you get this. It says, um, but each one of us is tried by being drawn out and enticed. Check this out. By his own desire, not drawn out and enticed by Satan. Notice that there's no whispering of the devil is not mentioned here. It says this person is enticed by their own desire. Then the desire, when it has become fertile, gives birth to sin. And, in, it, and, and so it turns into sin. And when it's been carried out, it then brings forth death. 
sin, you know, is in, in the thinking. And then it becomes fertilized and it becomes an action. And that action, you know, brings forth death. This is without the demons. This is without any force of darkness that's involved at all. This is without the mention of Lucifer in any way. This potion for self-destruction that brings forth eternal death resides in us. So to answer that question about the contradiction, there is no contradiction. We can resist the devil. But our real work is not in this defeated foe that the Lord said, I've already overcome the world. Which means that the, the God of this world, which is Satan, has already been under uh, under his feet. It's already He's already destroyed. The salvation and the work of the Holy Spirit is not to make sure that the devil stays underfoot. The work of the Holy Spirit is on us. The Holy Spirit guides us and leads us to all truth. The Holy Spirit reproves us of sin. Doesn't reprove Satan. Does not, it's not even involved. Satan's not even involved. This is about us. It's not what, you know, goes into a man that defiles a man. But it's what comes out of a man that defiles the man. That means that the defiling is already there. So hopefully that'll help you with the difference between looking at the devil, who we have the power to resist, and this evil that is ever present that resides in this heart. The, the, the Bible says deceitfully wicked above all things. Did you hear that? Above all things. Who can know it? The heart of man has actually exceeded this wickedness. That even the Lord says, it's wicked above all things. It conceives its own sin. So when you begin to look at that, that's major. Satan does not bring us to death. Our sin, the sin that resides in us, the nature that we have, it's the one that does that. So there's that evil that's ever present. Listen, hopefully that's a little bit of revelation that will help you to uh, understand that question. Let's look at our question, our third question. All of these are great questions too, and I appreciate it. I like this question. Um... It says, I saw a cartoon depiction of Jesus as a pot-smoking Rasta and a pedophile and was totally disgusted. I remember seeing that. I saw the, the, the pot-smoking Rasta uh, caricature as well uh, and, and pedophile, and I was totally disgusted. Isn't that blasphemy, and aren't the writers and producers in danger of hell? Um, well, you listen, I don't know who's going to hell. I, you know, I, That's not my job uh, to see whether they're in danger of hell, but I guarantee you what you're talking about is blasphemy, right? Which is an unforgivable sin, right? The, the, you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. That the Lord says, I will not forgive. But any other sin, he says, that, that I'll forgive. Now, I think I want you, I want you to look at this and I want you to remember something because I understand, you know, you don't want to, we don't want to defame the, the image of Christ. We, you know, there's, there, it'd be disgusting to defame the, the very picture of Jesus. But the first thing we have to remember is that whenever they have a portrait of Jesus, they're not really portraying Jesus. The, 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 whether he's a Rasta, whether he's Asian, whether, you know, Jesus, is, they have him depicted as a pedophile, whoever that person is, that the guy with the long hair. Uh, you know, with the, the long robe on and the beard and the, you know, the pale skin. That, that Whoever they're portraying, that's a, they're, they're only mocking an imitation of an imitation. That's not actually Christ. Jesus himself didn't leave any portraits of himself. He didn't say, he didn't give us any particular descriptions. You know, he's about 5'7", you know, 135 pounds, you know, real skinny. Like Isaiah doesn't really paint a real great picture of him. He talks about the fact that he's probably not that attractive. Was not The Bible says, you know, we, he, he was not that great to look upon. So he, obviously his physical characteristics and his physical appearance was not that important. Was that important? Was enough uh, important to Christ enough for him to even give a description of himself? So, you know, we might think you know, we might think by being offended by this and like, you know, getting up in arms and shaking our fists and just being angry about this, which seems natural for a believer. It seems like that's what we're supposed to do. That's what Christians are supposed to do. And like if we're firmly aligned with the Bible and with Christ, we're going to be outraged and up in arms. But what we've got to understand is that there are honor religions out there. You know, the Islam is an honor religion. You know, you 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 got to you know for you know you're forced in some ways to uh you know to really secure the honor of God to, of, of you know of God to make sure that his image stays sacred but that's not christianity that's not what we do believers in Jesus Christ are not commanded to defend his honor that's not what we do we're told to defend the faith um an image of a, a created image of Christ is not the faith we we're told to defend the faith to be able to give an answer for the hope that we have, but that's not where our hope lies in some, you know, in some 
image of Christ, that we could, an image that we don't even know, an image that we're going to fight against, that, an image that we don't that we don't, we know is probably not even real, not even true. We know it's the best view that some people in Europe could have had, or you know, if you if he looks like a Rasta, that comes from the, the the mind of a cartoonist, but that's not from the mind of Christ. And so when you look at this. This is part of what we're going to do. We share in the scorn that's directed at Christ, but we don't have to defend his honor. No way. We don't have to come down to any uh, animators and, and any animators and you know want their job. We don't have to come down to their place of business and boycott. No, this is what's going to happen. The, the world is just mocking. This is not blasphemy. This is just mockery. And listen, I think that when you begin to look at this, the idea of responding to irreverent cartoons. Remember that we had this with with, with uh, you know, the Muslims. Uh, I, I forgot the name of the uh, the uh, place in uh, France where they you know they sh they killed some people over depictions of Muhammad. Listen, that's not Christianity. That's not what we do. You know, listen. I mean, you you want to show an angel and an angel is doing something outrageous. We don't. We're not defending angels. We don't look and say no, no, no. That those are citizens of heaven. We 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 we're, we're obligated to make sure that people look at them right. No, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're obligated to live accordingly so that people can see the Christ in us. That's what we do. We don't look at commercials. Listen, I can tell you right now, caricatures of Jesus. This is not real blasphemy. This is just mockery. Uh, these are. This is not new. There's nothing of this is really new. But you know, I want you to understand something. God has thicker skin than that, and so should we as believers. And you got to remember, this. You know, Jesus had people who mocked him. Jesus said, "Remember the guy stabbed him in the ribs. Remember they were trying to. They were going to break his legs. They they put the crown of thorns on his head and said, no, there's the king of the Jews.' They laughed at him. What did he do? He prayed for them." He prayed for those people that were trying, that were, that were looking to kill him. Because they knew what, you know, crucifixion ends in death. There's no reprieve from that. So the, the people were, they acted like they didn't know he was going to be crucified because they beat him badly all night long. And all of that was there. And guess what? After even the, even the guy who's going to stab him in the ribs, who eventually did, what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He saw ignorance. He didn't look and say, this is blasphemy. He saw ignorance. So listen, let me tell you blasphemy. You want to, work, want to deal with blasphemy? The worst form of blasphemy is not receiving the word of God. It's a refusal to hear. That's blasphemy. And for that sin of not hearing the word, rejecting the word, that's the one where people are going to go to hell. I can tell you right now, that's not cheap humor. That's not mockery. Listen, these petty squabbles over cartoons and all these other things that, you know, lead us off the path, make us run down this little rabbit hole that the enemy wants us to go down. These are distractions. They, they, they touch our sense of righteousness. They, they, they touch our sense of indignation. And we can call it righteous indignation, but it's really just personal indignation. And it motivates us to fight for a fake image. That's the ridiculous part. That's the trick of the enemy, that we're fighting for Jesus that we have no idea how he looked. And so they say, well, we think he looked like this. He's been looking like this for the last 500 years. This is how we painted him 300 years ago. So that's your Jesus. Now go fight for him. No, we don't, we don't fight over some image that was created by man. That, that's, that's ridiculous. What we do is we, we develop ourselves and we allow the spirit to develop ourselves. And what we want to do is not defend a fake image, but we want to develop a relationship with the real and true Lord, who is Jesus Christ. So, let the kids play with the cartoons. Let them have it. Uh, whether it's Saturday morning, whether it is, uh, you know, on a Wednesday evening, let them have that. But the adults have some real work to do. And my hope is that you're one of the Christian adults who's not going to go out there and fight about a cartoon, but who's going to live the real Christ so people can see the real Christ. That's what we need to do. And hopefully that answer helps you to be able to see where we need to go. These are distractions. Don't get distracted. Stay focused on the real Jesus, not the fake one. Listen, hopefully that helps you with uh, that question. Let's look at question number four. It says, you've dealt with something similar to this before, but I'm still a little puzzled. Glad to hear it. Let's make sure that that puzzlement is gone by the end of this. Eve had never been exposed to lying before, and it seems unfair to blame her for her lack of experience. If an adult lies to a child and the child follows the adult, we don't normally blame the child. You are right. You're absolutely right. You know, you, I mean, even, even if you told a child, you know, don't follow strangers and a stranger lured them in with a cute puppy or lured them in with some candy. Listen, we go directly after that person, that adult who did that. We never come after the child. And so 
But I want you to understand something about Eve, because you're right. She had never been exposed to a lie before. Never that. But let me tell you what she had been exposed to. She had been exposed to the truth. What she she though she didn't understand totally the sin of lying. She you know we had talked to her about it. Uh, she wouldn't have understood it as we understood today. But what she did understand was the concept of having a choice. They could choose to obey God's command, or they could choose to disobey His command and embrace the consequences. The Lord told them, "Don't do it. If you do it." Here's the consequences. They knew that. The question that you're asking assumes that uh, Eve was like a child, right? That, that her perception was like that of a, of, a, of a child. And I can promise you this. Eve was not made like a child. Her perception was not like a two-year-old or three-year-old. Not even close. This is a grown woman. And, and I want you to understand something. Not just a grown woman, but this is, she was fearfully and wonderfully made. This is a grown woman with intelligence. And it's a grown woman with free will. What we know about Adam, what we know about Eve is it's spectacular. They were spectacular beings. And God had given her superior intelligence, had given her everything she needed to, to know to make the right decision. She wasn't born just yesterday, like the day before Eve popped up and now the certain come, serpent comes and he deals with her and she's just like oblivious to everything. No, she wasn't born yesterday. No, no way. While she does lack experience, and we realize that there's some experience that Eve doesn't have, but Eve also has a perfect brain. She has an untainted brain, a brain that you and I know nothing about, a brain that doesn't have sin wrapped around it, that can be that it can be pulled by it and, and moved by it. No, she's got this perfect brain that would have allowed her to be able to make the right decision with the information that she had. She knew the law and she recited it. Genesis 3, 2. And the, and this, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said about the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, you must not eat it. No, you must not even touch it. Otherwise, otherwise you will die. What does that know? What does that tell us? Eve knew full well what God had said. She knew that he had told her the, not only that she wasn't supposed to do it, but she also was told the punishment directly by God. And when you see this, you don't see Eve just like a kid, just being pulled in by the sweetness of the fruit. No, you see that there was an offer laid out, put on the table. Eve actually considers the offer. She thinks about it. Hmm, you're right, man, that, that would be good for food, man. Hmm, maybe, maybe he doesn't want us to, you know, maybe, maybe we will become like gods and like, you know, become wise just like him. No, she thinks about this. So this is not like a baby. It's not like a kid. This is a, an intelligent woman who makes a choice. She makes a choice to believe the voice of a stranger over the voice of God, the heavenly father that she knows. So what's the point here? Well, the question, the point is really this. Does it matter that Eve was never told a lie before? This is a simple choice. Really, it's really an easy, easy choice. And the facts are actually already laid out. God says it's forbidden. A weird talking serpent says it's not forbidden. God says don't do it. And the talking snake says do it. She knows God. She has never seen this serpent before. God's the only one who's been talking to her. Now she's got a snake that's talking to her. Listen. Under no circumstances do we is Eve absolved. And in no circumstances God absolved Eve because he knows what he made. Eve was fully conscious and aware of God's command and fully able to resist the devil. That's connected to the other question. And so I want you to see this. In this case, Eve didn't resist the devil, but she could have. She was fully capable. God had given her everything. So that's the reason why she didn't need to know about a lie. Listen, you don't need to know what's in room number two in order for you to understand a person who's sovereign and, and a, or a person who's an authority who says to you, don't go in room number two. Now, no matter what someone else tells you, no matter what thing they can lure you with, you would not be absolved. If you said, well, I didn't know that they were, you know, I'd never heard music before. I'd never seen dancing girls before. That's the reason why I went in there. You know, I'd never seen a strobe light. That's what drew me in there. Listen, none of that matters. It, and it may be true. You've never seen a dance girl. Never seen a strobe light. Never heard music like that. All that may be true. But what you have to admit is that, did you hear me when I said, don't go in there? Did you hear me when I said, if you go in there, you'll be fired? Is it strange if you get your pink slip? Am I, would I, would the person in authority be at fault? If they fired you on the spot, absolutely not, because they've given you all the information you need to know to be safe from room number two.
That's what God did. He gave her everything she needed to resist the devil. He didn't give her all the knowledge that, that we even have today. But we don't need all that knowledge in order to obey God. We simply have to hear his word and follow what he says. That's the simplicity of the command. Hopefully that helps with that question. We're down now to our fifth and final question. And I hope this has been a blessing to you guys because I love these questions. I like where you're going. I like the th thought process. And hopefully this is able to kind of move you in a direction where you're able to understand the mind of God a little bit, a little bit easier. Because that in a little bit uh, much more in depth because that's what this is about, that we go deeper in our knowledge of Christ. Let's look at question number five. It says, if God is not a God of partiality or favoritism, then why are the Jews called the chosen people? I like this because, you know, we've been talking about this with uh, Kanye. Well, Kanye has been kind of talking about it. Kyrie Irving. A lot of people have been talking about that. And uh, we're going to get into that even a little bit later this evening on uh, the uh, Pass the Noise podcast. We're going to talk about a, a little bit, some subjects very similar to this. But that's why I want you to tune in there as well. But you're here. Let's get into number five. Why they call the chosen people of God is not uh, uh, respective persons. If he doesn't show any partiality, if he doesn't show any favoritism, that seems like favoritism. Now, chosen. Let's take a look at the word, because from the Western viewpoint, you know, for, uh, in, in our minds, you know, uh, the word chosen has a, well, it, it really kind of connects to equal or kind of connects to um, preferred, right? It's one of those things where we kind of prefer, you know, you go out to dinner and uh, you, you kind of decide what food you want to eat. You go, you decide the place that you want to go. And when you choose that place, it means that we generally prefer, I want chicken over Beef, or I want you know I'm I'm really looking to go to Chick Fil A, over McDonald's. I, I I prefer it, right? So if they're all in a line and there's a big food court, you know we look and we pick that place. It means that I picked you over that one. That's kind of how we see it. But there's a contrast. That's not how the Bible sees. It. That's not how God uses it. When you begin to look at that, uh, chosen, it's actually about a function or a purpose. You know when you're picked by God, you're not picked because you're His favorite. You're picked for a purpose. Let, let me read something to you in Romans chapter 2. It says God is not a respectful person. It says he does not show favoritism or partiality. That's it. Th th you look in, in Romans 2, that's exactly what it says. This is not the nature of God. So it, it means that God didn't pick the Jews because he liked them better than any of the nations in the world. It was for something else, a specific purpose that he had for them, a plan that he has for them. Listen. You got when you go into your bathroom. You've got several things you can use to brush your teeth, right? You got a toothbrush. Uh, you you know you got the toilet scrubber that's in there. You got maybe a brush that you may use to scrub the 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 tub, right? You can choose any of them. If you pick your toothbrush, is that because you like your toothbrush better than the toilet scrubber, right? Is that because you like your toothbrush better than the scrubber that you use for the tub? No, it's because that's the purpose of a toothbrush. It is to brush your teeth that you're not going to use that toothbrush in the tub, right? There's a, there's a brush for that. So when you choose the toothbrush, it's because it fits the purpose that you have, right? That's exactly what it is. It's chosen for a particular purpose. I want you to read something out of the book of uh, De Deuteronomy 7, 6. I'm going to read this for you. It says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. This is Israel for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. That's chosen, right? That's what that sounds like favoritism. Man, that sounds like partiality. I, I picked you out of all the nations of the world. He's called them a holy people. But you know what that holy means? Set apart, right? Set apart for a specific purpose. When we see that, we look and say, oh, so you're calling them better than us. No, he says they are set apart for a particular purpose. But let's keep reading. It says, I'm going to read this, Deuteronomy 7 and 8, right? This is chapter 7. Well, I read six. This is seven and eight. It says, the Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest, but because the Lord loved you and kept his oath, which he swore to your fathers. Whoa, wait a minute. You're saying he, cho he chose them, not for the reasons that we would normally see someone who would be preferred or someone who would have, there'd be partiality or favoritism. He says, no, I chose you for a specific purpose. What's that purpose? I made an oath to your forefathers long ago. I promised Abraham that uh, you know, that I would multiply his seed, his seed and his descendants would be like the stars in the sky. 
I promised Abraham that I would give a particular land to his descendants, that they would have it forever. I told him that I would bless him and his seed, and that through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's why I picked you. So when you look at this, we kind of look at this and people use the chosen people aspect and it really is divisive. And it's one of the reasons why the Jews have been divided from Christians, you know, because we, you know, people fight over that blacks and, and, and um, Arabs. And there's, there's so much because who are you to think that you're chosen? And we can, you know, we look at that and, and you hear that in many, many arguments and you hear that in Middle Eastern arguments. They're not chosen. This wasn't their land. God said, I'm going to give you the land. I picked you out for this particular purpose to be a light to the world. I'm going to use you guys to actually be the ones to literally carry the torch and light the rest of the world up. That's, that's what, you know, God was showing aspects of his, of his characteristics through this one nation. I'm going to, sh I'm sharing this with the whole world, but I'm just picking them to be the ones to carry the flag. Listen, you know, if you carry, you know, if you walk in and you're chosen to carry the torch, it doesn't mean you're better than anybody else. There's a specific reason why Muhammad Ali, for instance, was was brought in the torch. You know, he, could, he couldn't run it in. He, he wasn't an athlete, a current athlete anymore. But there was a real reason why they picked him, set him aside for that purpose. God said this. There's a reason why I picked the Jews. He says, God so loved the world. That's why I chose him. By sending his son to die on the cross. He sends him through this Jewish family. Jesus was a Jew. He sends him through this Jewish family from the line of Judah, from the, the lineage of David, because he said he would. That's one of the reasons why he chose him. So this is not, uh, you know, favoritism. And when you, when, you, when you think about it, God said, I love the whole world that I gave my only begotten son. Not just the Jews. I love the whole world. And Jesus' ministry was to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, right? And so by faith, Christians have become a part of this promise of Abraham. We don't ever become Jews, but we always are his people. And so when you look at that, I hope you understand that even as Christians, this is not about partiality. When God picks someone and, 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 and you don't have that same calling, it's not because that person with the calling is more special than you. It is because they have a different purpose than you. And that's what choosing is all about. Being chosen is about the purpose and the assignment and the mission not about being super, super special. But listen, when you understand that God chooses all of us and gives us all this opportunity, he's actually saying to us, all of you all are special because I sent my only begotten son that whoever would believe in me would not perish, but have everlasting life. What an awesome God. Listen, again, we're at the end of our live at five. I am so thankful for the questions. And I hope again that these were a blessing to you. That's my hope, is that the questions are a blessing, but the answers are also a blessing. But listen, we're going to continue this because in about an hour or an hour and a half or so, we're going to be back here at our Pass the Noise podcast. Some of you all have seen it. Some of you all have not. Listen, I want you to tune in because we're going to be asking you some questions tonight. Some, some things that I think are going to really be deep about cancel culture. We want to talk about some specific aspects, but what is that really? What does that really mean? And what does that really mean to you? And we want to talk a little bit about racism in America, but not just racism, sexism, lots of isms that are going on in our country. And we really want to delve into what being canceled is really all about. And is free, is, is speech really free? All of these are a lot of top. You know, listen, it takes a lot to get through it and it's going to take us and it's going to take you. We're going to have to do this together. Let's get back together here. So listen, you've turned, tuned in for Live at Five. I'm thankful. Come on back at seven o'clock because we're going to be right back here again on Facebook at Pass the Noise Podcast. We're also going to be back. We're, we're on YouTube as well on Pass the Noise. So if you don't catch us on Facebook, catch us there on YouTube. Check us out. Like the page. Uh, give it, make, make sure you comment. We really want this to be interactive and we want to make sure that we educate people as much as possible. Because like I always say, the most powerful believer is an educated believer. Listen, we're at the end of this Live at Five. And again, I thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to share. God bless you and have an awesome, awesome Wednesday.